Oxford in 1963, I think, um, to Trinity. Mm. And I was the only biologist in the college and um, enjoyed myself hugely. I did no work whatsoever for two years because in those days you didn't have to take any exams for two years. Um, and I was advised to take prelims before I went up, so I did, and I passed. And before you went up? Before I went up. You could do that in those days. Mm -hmm. So I did that and I passed them, so there were no more exams until, not the tripos, whatever it was called, mm -hmm. schools, um, mm -hmm. at the end, finals. Um, and uh, so I really didn't work for two years, which probably, in retrospect, was a pity. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I had a wonderful time. I acted and um, generally sort of messed around and put out of my mind what was coming. But I was extremely fortunate in the third year to be part of a pioneering new course in zoology, which was um, instituted by a man called John Pringle. Pringle. Uh, Pringle, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that that um, did change me. Um, so, well, the, it, yes, it was. It was in the third year. Um, and Pringle's view was that, that, that um, biology could be unified around the idea of information. So information theory was one of the keys to everything we learned in that year. And Pringle emphasised this. And it's, it, was a, it was a radical change from a sort of classical descriptive kind of zoology to a much more analytical reductionist, but at the same time um, a, a, a view of the animal world which was synthetic in the sense that information and the flow of information could actually bring you to understand um, what these different things were doing. Um, so that was enormously stimulating. And um, at the same time, we were being taught by an absolutely glittering constellation of people. So I was taught neuroscience by Pringle, who himself was a very distinguished neuroscientist. I was taught about animal behaviour by Nico Timbergen. I was taught about ecology by Charles Elton. I was taught developmental biology by John Gurdon. And who I'm going to interview. Oh really? Mm. Yes. Um, um, and one can't imagine a more privileged beginning. I mean, it was absolutely stunning. Um, and of course, I mean, those are just the names that people recognise. There were other very interesting people. Um, a man called Pusey, who taught us about bones. Um, a man called Palin, who taught us about fish. Um, I, mean, I, I, I sort of, I can't remember <laughs> the others, but they were, they were equally good. And, and I was very stirred by Tin Bergen and by Gurdon. And John Gurdon's lecturing style is... Can you say something about those two? Uh, I think. Well, Tin Bergen mm -hmm. was inspirational because he, he, he brought to me uh, animal behaviour and he, 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 he... To me, animal behaviour up till that point had been something just immense and... Uh, you couldn't order it in any way. And he, he provided you with a way of thinking about animal behaviour and actually about biological subjects in general. Um, and he, he said, what, what, what Pringle said was that you don't understand a mouse until you can make a mouse, um, which many other people have said, but, it, but to us it was very, um, it was very influential. What, what, um, what Tim Bergen emphasised was that you wouldn't understand animal behaviour without understanding um, the underlying 
mechanisms. That was extremely important. So he would not hear of any distinction between um, neuroscience and ethology. He said ethology is grounded in an understanding of how the nervous system works to generate the behaviours that we study. So that was very important. The underlying mechanisms were important. He, you need to understand the mechanism, he said. You need to understand how it develops. And that, for me, was a thought which was very influential. And you need to understand how it has evolved. And you need to understand what it is adapted to do. Um, and he, he sort of had this programmatic view almost of what you do, but, but he illustrated it by these wonderful examples of his own work on the guards. And here was the man who'd done these simple, illuminating experiments, taking the trouble to tell us about them. It's quite, quite wonderful. Uh, so I was transfixed by that. Um, John Gurdon, completely different. I mean, he was just so clear. And he, he's always had this amazing clarity in his lecturing. He lectures with immense care and deliberation. And he tells you what he's going to talk about. He, he, op he opens up to you a question and then pursues it in a way that to somebody who had had in earlier incarnations a sort of bumbling, sort of rambling, sort of this sort of highly ordered, almost crystalline lecturing from John Gurdon was wonderful because it did bring order to, again, something that was very difficult to get a grasp on. That's to say, the idea of the emergence of order from ultimately simple beginnings. Um, and he showed you how you could actually get a purchase on this and do serious experiments with it. Um, so that was, that was extraordinary influential for me, although um, I didn't really want to do the sorts of embryology that he did. Um, although I could see, and this led me down a wrong path, a wrong turn initially, I could see that logically if one wanted to understand how um, animals develop, then one needed to um, one needed to pursue the sort of embryology that he did um, on amphibians, on frogs and toads and things like that. Um, and uh, that led me, uh, when I came to think about doing a PhD, to um, to follow the logic and say, well, I want to be a developmental biologist. I want to understand how pattern is generated in developing organisms. So um, I'd better go and study amphibian embryos. Um, and this actually, I mean, it had another dimension to it. that I, I'd specialised in... Well, we didn't specialise really because we... That was the wonder of it, of that course, that we could do so many different things at the same time and hold them in your hand. Um, but I'd, I'd done a lot on fish. I'd become quite an expert in fish. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I'd done lots of other things as well. And uh, I, I um, did very well in my exams. And the external examiner approached me afterwards and said, um, what are you going to do? Um, and I said, um, because this was true at the time, that I was going to go on and do VSO and organise fishermen's cooperatives in Burundi. Um, and he said, well, um, are you really interested in fish? And I said, not really. And he said, no, I didn't think so. Um, and um, I thought you were more interested in other things. And if ever you wanted to do a PhD, you might want to consider coming and doing it with me. 
And so I was very struck by that, particularly because he was an amphibian embryologist, a really wonderful man called David Newth, who worked in Glasgow. And um, so I said that I'd bear that in mind, and thank you very much, and so on. And I was going to go to Burundi, looking forward to it immensely. Um, and uh, my father had had TB um, in the early 50s, and he had a recurrence just before I took my finals, a really quite serious one. And he went to a, um, a sanatorium in Sussex, Hampshire, Sussex, and, and um, to recover. And so I had to have a test to see whether I had TB. That was required for everybody doing BSA. And so it seemed sensible, since I was visiting my father in the sanatorium, to have a test for TB in the sanatorium. And that was a big mistake, because, of course, I was seen by an expert. And um, experts are always terribly good at detecting the tiniest hint of the thing that they're specialists in. So he detected TB. And I said, well, I'm going to Africa. And he said, no, you're not. Um, you can't go to Africa. You will stay in England. Um, and you will take these pills. And he gave me a course of um, ghastly drugs, which I didn't take because I hated them so much. And VSO went out of the window. And I was left to my own devices, taking these pills, supposedly, for six months. And then I went back to see him again. And uh, he said, oh, yes, I remember you. He said, you're a person who we thought might have TB. And he gave, did another series of actions. And he said, well, there's nothing there now. He said, and to be honest, you know, I didn't really think there was anything there in the first place. Oh, I could have killed him. I could have killed him. But the result of that was that I was at a loose end. So I went to work with Newth in Glasgow um, and decided that I hated it. And by that time, I also had quite a, an important girlfriend in London. And... Um, I felt very frustrated about being in Glasgow doing something that I really didn't enjoy. And at, the, and at that moment, there appeared the opportunity to become a journalist in London, working on a rather feeble little magazine called Animals Magazine. And I was, they wanted an assistant editor, so I applied for this and got it, and became assistant editor of Animals Magazines and had a high old time living in um, Gooch Street, flat and sort of just walking up and down going to work. Uh, in is this the Beatles time now? Yes it was, yeah, <laughs> you know, I was having a high old time <laughs> and I had this gorgeous girlfriend and um, uh, all was very good but I felt pretty uneasy about what I'd landed myself into um, and I remember sitting in my flat in Goose Street and reading um, something about the nervous system and its development. And I thought, I really cannot bear this. That's what I want to study. I want to study the development of behavior. I want to know where it comes from. And, um, I, and, and I think that, that it, it, it's so important that when you decide to do research, you really do decide that you must. You can't do. It. You can't live without it, and that was my feeling. So, I'd been reading a book by a man called Martin Wells called uh, "You, Me, and the Animal World," and it's a it's a very very simple book. Um, and and I knew that Martin was in Cambridge, and I wrote to him, and I said, "Do you think there's any possibility that one might be able to do a PhD?" looking at the development of behaviour in some organism. And this was a, this was a turning point for me, and a really important um, moment, and a moment of intense gratitude to Martin Wells, because he was on sabbatical at the time, so he wasn't in Cambridge. And my letter was forwarded to him in America. And he took the trouble to write an extended letter back to me uh, from America, saying that unfortunately he was on sabbatical, um, but that he thought that actually what I was suggesting was perfectly feasible and a 
an interesting thing to want to do. And why didn't I um, present myself in the Department of Zoology and ask um, whether somebody would take me on to do a PhD? Um, so I, I did that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I think this, this is, it's, it's off the point, but, but um, I don't know how you felt about Cambridge when you were Oxford, but to me, it was a very, um, uh, Oxford was a colourful place, and Cambridge was somewhat grey, and it was quantitative, and it was frightening. Um, you know, things were pretty serious in Cambridge, in a way that they weren't in Oxford. So I felt fairly in awe. Uh, when I came to um, Cambridge to see, to be interviewed by the professor of zoology, a very interesting man called Torquil Vice Fogg. Um, how, do you, how do you spell that? T O R K E L, that was his Christian name, mm. and Vice Fogg, which is W E I S hyphen F O G H, Danish. Mm. Uh, very interesting man. Very, very good looking man very um, impressive figure. I always thought he looked like a Norwegian seaman. Um, <laughs> he wore one of those sort of Scandinavian sort of blue suits. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was interviewed by Vice Fogg uh, in a room which contained Vice Fogg and another man. And um, Vice Fogg said to me, um, well, you have made a very interesting proposal to us, and uh, um, you have to understand that in this department we work on insects. And I thought, I thought in the back of my head, oh my God, I never thought of working on insects, I hate insects. Um, and he said, so I think that what you suggested is very interesting, and you could work with me, he said, on um, locust flight because it's a very interesting question where flight comes from developmentally. Um, and I thought, God almighty, I could never work with this man who's so clever and quantitative and numerous. And <laughs> I'm no good at maths, I can't do this. And he said, but on the other hand, he said, my colleague here at Traherne has a proposal to put to you, which you might consider interesting. And then his other man, who is sort of twinkly and uh, fun, hmm. in comparison to this very straight-laced figure, said, well, yes, he said, you see, I've always wondered, he said, how does a caterpillar become a moth, he said. Moths have completely different behaviours from caterpillars. And um, so that's, that's a mystery right there, he said. <laughs> so, so why don't you do a PhD on that? So I thought, yes, you're right. <laughs> it's absolutely fabulous. I'll do that. <laughs> so I said, yes, I'll work with you. I had, I mean, no second bidding. I mean, I was just, I was just sold, hook, line, and sinker. So, in October of '68, um, I came up to Cambridge and started work on the way in which a caterpillar becomes a moth, um, and actually got stuck instantly at the intervening stage, the pupa which I found intensely interesting in its own right. Um, because it turned out that pupae, far from being the sort of um, dormant organisms that people think they are, are actually intensely alive and have to defend themselves and uh, generally look after themselves. And they have a little, at least the ones that I looked at, which were privet hawk moth ones, uh, privet, privet hawk moth caterpillars and pupae, um, that they have a little defensive reflex called the gin trap response, um, in which they flex their abdomens in response to a little tickle, um, in a way that traps the offending creature in a little pit between adjacent segments, so they sort of go boom, like that, and, and trap them. So I got very interested in this, um, this reflex, and I worked out um, the pathways that I met, in the course of this, um, a man called Peter Lawrence, who was in the 
just come back from America to work in the MRC, the LMB. And um, he had developed this very interesting um, set of ideas about um, how the insect segment, this unit of the body, is patterned. And um, in fact, there was a whole school. I mean, nothing that I did was in a vacuum, because there was a whole school um, founded by this man, Wigglesworth, who was in zoology at the time, which was to do with um, insect physiology and development. And, and Wigglesworth had developed this, this segment, the surface of the insect, the layer of cells that makes the cuticle and its various decorations on the outside. He developed that as a, as a preparation in which one could study the formation of patterns. Um, how is it that cells at one position know that they will form this structure and cells at another will form this structure? And Peter, Peter Lawrence, had, had, who was Wigglesworth's student, had developed this notion and, and come up with the idea that there was a gradient of um, positional information, as it was called in those days that extended from the anterior segment to the posterior, and that cells could assess their position in this gradient and then decide what to do. And this was very much in tune with ideas of um, Lewis Wolpert, who was also very influential at that time. And it struck me that what I was studying in the segment was a little bit of the segment, which when you tickled it, would provoke a reflex, whereas any other bit of the segment would not. And that therefore there must be something special about these cells which cause them to wire themselves in a particular way in the nervous system, such that those cells would provoke the reflex and the others would not. Um, so I discussed these ideas with Peter and we developed a model for gradients in the segment specifying differences not only between cells at the surface but differences between cells that would then be reflected in their connections within the central nervous system and um, that was a I, I still think that was a good idea and it turned out to be right actually we didn't do the experiments but we were right there was a difference what the nature of the gradient is is still not known but there, there were differences, and if you moved cells around in the gradient, then you could alter the way in which they wired in the central nervous system. So other people did that, that work. But this was... I was so fortunate in my PhD, because, I, because Traherne, who was absolutely... and he's one of the most life-enhancing men one can imagine... Um, What's his first name? John. John, John Trevon. Yeah. Um, he died in the late 80s, but he was, he was, a, he was, he was a wonderful man. He made everything fun. Um, he was just a <laughs> fabulous person. Um, but he left me alone, totally. Um, um, he, didn't, he didn't really supervise my PhD at all. He just let me get on with it. And when I'd written my thesis, he said, I don't understand this. He said, it's all words. Um, I don't understand it. But it's, it's obviously John Good, he said. Well, he said. Um, so, so well done. But he, he really, he didn't understand what I was on about. Um, and, but but, but the, the real point is that, um, that what, I, what I was doing was in a great tradition which was started by a man called Sperry um, who worked in the 30s and onwards and who had developed the idea that um, connections were formed between nerve cells because nerve cells could recognise differences between, between each other in a systematic fashion. So that, for example, the, the cells that he worked with, which were the cells of the retina, um, were, he thought, distinguished from each other by um, a gradient, and that cells at one position in the gradient in the retina would connect with a particular bit of the brain called the tectum, and with particular cells in the tectum that were identified by their position in the gradient. And he did um, sort of 
cutting and pasting and rotating experiments, which um, showed that in principle his theory must be right. Um, and my experiments with the gin trap reflex in the insect were of that kind. They were sort of um, uh, cutting and pasting experiments that were asking how do um, nerve cells connect with each other. And they were experiments um, that were done after the fact. So the, experiment, the, the, the connections had formed, and you tried to understand how they had formed. And Sperry had done the same thing. And so this worked out very well for me. And um, I had a PhD, a man called Horridge, uh, Adrian Horridge, who'd started a lab in Australia, um, which, among other things, was very interested in the idea of differences between nerve cells and how connections were made between them. Although Horridge himself didn't really understand. Well, no, that's not true. He wrote a very influential book about that. Um, so, I mean, yeah. Um, slightly got, got confused there, but I'll come back to Horridge in a minute. But, but the upshot of that was that having met Horridge, um, uh, he sort of vaguely hinted that if I wanted to do a postdoc, mm -hmm. I could do it with him, that I applied to do a postdoc and went out to Australia um, and wanted to continue to work with the gin trap and mm -hmm. pursue my PhD project as a postdoc. And this led to a very unsatisfactory a um, couple of years. Um, I was in Australia for four years altogether. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful time, but, but from the point of view of research, um, I was at a loose end, and I thought it was my fault. But I, in retrospect, I don't think it was. I think the whole field was confused and depressed because we didn't know what to do next. And um, I could not work with the gin trap because I could not bring my experimental animals into Australia because they were reckoned to be a pest quite recently. Um, and I actually I became, I became quite famous in Australia actually through advertising in the Sydney Morning Herald for caterpillars of the equivalent um, uh, species in Australia and offering, I forget how much, I think 10 cents a caterpillar for every one that I got. And of course I was deluged with caterpillars. <laughs> it was absolutely catastrophic. And I became known as the caterpillar man. Um, uh, but anyway, um, this didn't work out. I couldn't breed these animals and I could not work with the gym trap. And while all this was going on, I had a number of really, really good colleagues. Um, we were at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, in Horridge's group, and we used to discuss endlessly what it is that we should be doing if we wanted to understand how the nervous system develops. We really did have very intense little discussions about this. And I was completely at my wit's end. I really didn't know what to do. And Ian Meinertzhagen, who I believe is a nephew of the notorious Meinertzhagen, um, uh, was... Um, I mean, he, he was so important to me. Um, he, we were talking about things one day, and he said, well, he's extremely well-read. He said, why don't you um, go back to the beginning and look at the cells that make the nervous system? Nobody's done that, he said, since Wheeler in the 1890s. Um, and it's always been one of my failings that I'm absolutely a sucker for the next new thing and I just want to get on with it, I just want to go for it, you know. And so I thought this was an uh, absolutely fabulous idea. So um, there were grasshoppers um, in culture in this laboratory because they were using them to look at vision. So I, I got myself some grasshopper embryos and Lo and behold, they were wonderful, they were beautiful, they were these transparent creatures that I talked about, you know, the, the, what I liked in biology. They are the most beautiful animals. And um, I rediscovered what Wheeler had shown um, all those years ago, that there were these very big cells, um, which were repeated in segmental patterns and generated 
the segmentally organized nervous system of the insect. And these were called neuroblasts. They were the, the blast cells that produced the nervous system. And I mapped these cells and I showed how they divided. And um, at the same time, I asked a very simple question, which was, how do the very first nerve cells know where to put their axons? It's, it's lovely to have the privilege to ask such an elementary question, because nobody's asked, well, maybe you may have asked it before, haven't had the opportunity to answer it. And the reason for asking this question in my background was that Wigglesworth, the man who sort of pioneered the insect segment, had shown that nerve cells love to grow along their axons, the, the processes, love to grow along the processes of other nerve cells. So given a choice, an axon will grow along another axon. And that, of course, leads to a reductio ad absurdum, which is if they all follow each other, who did it first? And so it simply was trying to answer that question. And simply by studying the embryos and staining them and, and cutting sections and looking at them in electron microscopes and things like that, I could show that, lo and behold, there were um, cells out in the periphery, the ones that would be the sensory cells of the animal in the future, which in pairs were putting nerves into the central nervous system. And um, these nerves were growing in very regular ways, which indicated that they were following cues and growing and laying down the very first pathway. Um, so at the same time, I, I made a map of the neuroblasts and I showed where these so-called pioneer neurons came from and what their axons did and proposed a sort of model for the way the foundations of the nervous system were being laid. And I published the, 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 the pioneer neuron stuff in Nature and the, 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 the neuroblast stuff in our sort of house journal of embryology and stuff in, in, um, in what was called the Journal of Embryology and Experimental Morphology. In those days. Now it's called development. And um, this work with the very beginnings of the nervous system was was fairly revolutionary, I think. I really think it was. It, it, it introduced the notion that one, if one really wanted to understand how the nervous system develops, then you better go back to the beginning and see what actually happens, rather than looking at it after the event and trying to work out what the rules are. Um, so, um, having done this in Australia, Horridge was rather like John Traherne, but much less um, enjoyably so, um, didn't understand what I was doing. Um, but he did understand a paper in Nature, that was good enough for him. Mm. But he, um, I, I wanted to do experiments with this system and I needed a laser and I needed to learn about embryos. So the obvious place to go was Germany, where the great sort of insect embryologists were. And, um, and there was a laser in Freiburg. So I applied to go to Freiburg. And I left Australia, which I bitterly regretted ever since, because I loved every minute of it. Um, and I went to Germany. Which, with apologies to my German colleagues, I felt like felt like having a bag of soot placed over my head after being in the sort of free, sunny world of Australia, coming to a German winter in Freiburg in a very, very conservative institute, where, although I'd done German at school, I didn't speak a word of it, really. Um, so I was pretty unhappy, and the experiments didn't work. And um, uh, it was a pretty black, bleak time for me. Um, but... What year are we in now? We're now in 1973. So, I think, hmm. by, 
No, 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 not 1973. Good Lord, no. Uh, 1976, sorry. Yeah. Because that, that would get rid of a lot of <laughs> Australia. No, 1976, hot mm. summer. Mm. Um, and in that year or the following one, probably the following one, I encountered in Freiburg, having learned German, and I mean that was a good aspect mm. of the German experience, um, I encountered a woman called Yanni Nuslein Folhart, and she came to the lab probably need to spell her name. Her so. name is, well, her name is Christiana, which yeah. I think people can probably spell, but Nusslein Vollhardt is N-U umlaut double S-L-E-I-N V-O-L-H-A-R-D So two words, Nusslein Vollhardt. Um, she was a, a very impressive woman. Extremely irritating and provocative woman as well. Um, and clearly quite brilliant. She smoked and she whistled endlessly and she persuaded us in this lab in Freiburg that the way forward was genetics. Absolutely genetics. Um, and that genetics was the key to understanding things in biology. And she had dedicated herself to a project which was to take Drosophila, the fruit fly, and to use it to make a genetic analysis of the mechanisms that are involved in forming patterns. So what had happened to me was that I'd come from a lab that was deeply neuroscientific. And I'd gone to a lab that was deeply embryological and very classical. And then I encountered this woman with her revolutionary notion of doing genetics to understand developmental mechanisms. And it was a, it was a serious project for me, for her. Um, and she was quite ruthless in her pursuit of this goal. And she set out to learn a bit about zoology. She had a biochemical background. And at the same time, she learned about embryos and about Drosophila embryology. But at the back of their mind, her mind, steaming away, was this project. And she got funding to pursue this project in the um, European Molecular Biology Labs in Heidelberg. Um, and the essence of the project was this, that if there are mechanisms that operate in animals, then they must be encoded in the genome. Therefore, if we want to discover the nature of these mechanisms and whether they exist, we must make mutations. If the mechanisms are there, they are encoded in the genome, and it will be possible to disrupt them with mutations. If we cannot, they don't exist. But if we can, we will reveal the nature of these mechanisms by discovering and mapping the genes that encode them. Many people say that she was barking mad because they said if you make mutations and her notion was that she could find all the mechanisms necessary to make a pattern by looking for embryos that couldn't make patterns and she claimed and this was what people disputed that they would fail to make patterns in discrete steps so it wouldn't be that everything would be a mess but it would be an interpretable mess. And most people thought she was wrong. But she went out with huge dedication um, with colleagues to create mutations in Drosophila quite systematically until she had a collection of mutations affecting the formation of patterns in embryos. So these were embryos that would not survive but they would actually reveal that there were mutations that affected patterns. 
um, she would go on creating such mutations until she achieved what was called saturation, which was when she started to get the same mutations again and again and again. She did this, and this was in the era when molecular biology was just beginning, and um, genetics was the key, and genetics allowed you to map genes, but in a few years, molecular biology would allow you to go from the genes to the proteins that these genes encoded. That was what was so wonderful. And indeed, she discovered a great slew of genes that were required for making patterns. And um, she got the Nobel Prize for it in 1997. Quite absolutely one of the most justified Nobel Prizes there can ever have been. Because this was, this was revolutionary and the genes that she identified were... Um, as relevant to humans as they were to fruit flies. So the same genes, same places. Now, the, the effect of all this on me was to make me learn genetics and to become serious about what we had always said, which was that we wanted to understand how genes make brains, because we understood, at least in principle, that development was about translating genetic information into um, neural networks and behaviour. But we, unlike Yanni, we had never been serious about this project. We never said, well, what do we actually mean when we say we want to, it sounds good, we want to understand how genes make brains, but how do you actually go about doing that? What are we going to do? So the first thing um, that I did was to say, well, we'd better follow Yanni's line and work on fruit flies, Drosophila. So we worked on grasshopper embryos, which are huge, um, and we decided to work on fruit fly embryos, which were absolutely tiny. Um, and that was the moment at which I uh, abandoned grasshoppers and turned to fruit flies, and um, became more of a developmental geneticist than I had been uh, up till then. And Another very influential thing for me was that I met, um, I gave a seminar in Berkeley on my work on the grasshopper, and I encountered a man called Corey Goodman, who uh, I encountered him first as a pair of eyes at the back of this audience, boring into me throughout my talk. And later I, I met him, and he told me, oh, I really adore what you're doing, that's what I'm going to work on. Um, little did I know that, in fact, Corey was the sort of cuckoo in the nest, because he's a fantastic scientist. He's an amazing man, um, and he's capable of not only doing the most wonderful science himself, but of marshalling huge resources to get it done in an American fashion. So my project, um, to use insect embryos to understand how, rebuild nervous system, got slightly taken over by Corey at this point. Um, we collaborated and we continue to be extremely good friends. Um, and I think, that, to be fair, I should say that as far as I'm concerned, the success of this project um, depends to a large extent on the excellence of the work that Corey did based on what I had done. Um, and he took the field forward by leaps and bounds over the next few years. And in fact, I think together we spawned a, a, a large industry, which now is sort of in different parts of the world. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the most awful things that, I'm sure Corey wouldn't mind my saying this, but one of the most awful things that, that has happened um, to our particular little branch of science in recent times is the fact that he... Uh, went off and to work for a biotech company and stopped working in science, which was which was devastating. Um, anyway, um, that's what I work on: how genes make brains. Um, and if you want to ask me questions about that, um, <laughs> I can tell you how we do it. Um, mm -hmm. But the essence of the project is to understand. Um, 
genetic information is used to build the neural networks that underlie behavior. Um, and I think we understand a bit more about that um, because of the work that you've done. I mean, I should say that when I'd been in Germany, I was invited to apply for a job in Cambridge, and I came and I... I, I, well, that was, I was going to ask you, how did yeah. you come to Cambridge? And why well, I came, I came to Cambridge in 1980. Uh, after Freiburg, I, I was recruited by, again, I've been incredibly fortunate with the people that I've met and worked with. A man called Bonhoeffer, Friedrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was a Max Planck director in Tübingen, offered me a job in Tübingen, um, uh, in which I could effectively do what, what I liked. He said, you can have the basement um, and you can do what you like in it. And as far as I'm concerned, I like to have one person in my department who just does not uh, does whatever they like. Uh, it's not, not, not up to me, I just provide the money. So. so I took that with open arms. But unfortunately, I was then offered a job in Cambridge. Well, I say unfortunately. I mean, it only just interfered with this great thing in Tübingen. Um, because I got the job in Tübingen in 78 um, and was offered a job almost simultaneously in Cambridge. And... Um, this is a lectureship? Or? A lectureship in yeah. zoology. And... Um, uh, at first turned it down and then thought, no, this is crazy. You, you, you don't want to stay in Germany for the rest of your life um, and um, you, you really would like to come back to Cambridge and, and do work here because it's a fantastic opportunity. So I said, well, actually, I've changed my mind. I'd like to take it and they were good enough to let me do that. Um, and uh, oh, this was all on the understanding that it could be postponed for two years during which I would come and give lectures to the 1A sales course. Um, and then from 1980 I came full time. And that was when Gabriel Horn was professor. I was going to ask you about yeah. Gabriel because I've yeah. done lots of long interviews with or mm. been part of long interviews. Um, has he been a friend of yours? And oh, very much so, very much so. Um, I think, to begin with, we, we got off on the wrong foot because um, I sent him a letter, at least my understanding is that I sent him a letter saying that I was going to be late um, arriving, in, not on the 1st of October. Um, and I received a furious letter from Gabriel saying, where are you? And I said, well, didn't you get my letter? And he said, no, I did not. Um, you better get your arse over here as, as quickly as possible because otherwise there's going to be trouble. Um, so that was not a good, <laughs> a good beginning. Um, and I, th I think Gabriel thought I was a bit of a waste of space to begin with. I don't know. Um, uh, he was he was always very supportive, and and um, and after the first couple of years or so, he was incredibly supportive, mm -hmm. and I got on with him much better. But I think we did get off to a slightly mm -hmm. rocky start. Mm -hmm. um, but over the years, I mean, he's been he's been incredibly to me and his stewardship of the Department of Zoology was amazing and I mean it was it, it's always better to work in a department that is flourishing and a great success mm. um, and he was a very good head oh fantastic fantastic mm. at proselytising for zoology and I mean a man who is not or at least then was not a zoologist I think you can reasonably call himself an honorary zoologist now mm. um, <laughs> yeah and what about, did you know Pat Bateson at all, though? Yes, um, and actually I'd known Gabriel before, when Gabriel was in um, Cambridge, because my super, uh, this was one of the things about John Traherne, he sort of bought and sold his students without reference to them, so he swapped me with Gabriel on the understanding that Gabriel's postdoc would teach me how to make a certain sort of electrode, um, and I would teach Gabriel how to dissect grasshopper brains or something. Mm. Um, so I met Gabriel then, and he was extraordinarily nice to me then. Mm. And also because, and this is something that Gabriel and Pat may have talked about, um, we had this thing called the Neurophysiology Discussion Group in zoology at this time, which was partly, oh, well I think it was mostly to do with Hans Lissmann, mm. um, who organised it. But that was where I met Pat and mm. Gabriel and other neurophysiologists. This was when I was a PhD student. Um, and so that was my first introduction to them. And then I met Pat, uh, well, through zoology.
and we did have little seminars here in King's at one time when we sort of mm. He was provost when you were... He, he was not provost uh, when I first got to know him, no. He, Wait, did you come straight to a fellowship at King's? Or? No, 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 no. I was out in the wilderness for years. Mm. I came to King's in 1992. Mm. Um, uh, I had a slightly bruising encounter with King's, actually, to begin with, because um, I was asked whether I would be interested in a fellowship, and um, said that I might be, um, and... Hummed and hard and said I wanted to find. I actually didn't understand anything. I didn't understand about the supervision system. I didn't understand anything. Um, so I said, look, I need to know, find out more about what's involved. Um, and uh, the people concerned turned around and said, well, I, don't worry, we're not interested in anything. You know, so obviously the idea was that you're <laughs> you're either incredibly flattered and uh, you should sort of go down on your knees and say that you want to be a fellow of Kings, or you obviously don't want to be a fellow of Kings. And I obviously fell into the latter category at that stage. <laughs> So they said, no, thank you, um, on your way, sport. Um, so, but in 1992, um, Chris Gilligan, actually, I think it was, um, sort of encouraged me mm. to... Um, to uh, it was when Gabby Dover left, and they were looking for a replacement. Mm. Yeah. That's how he became a Before that, you weren't a fellow of a college. No, I wasn't a fellow. Which actually is, is... I mean, I think many people in Cambridge find it a very difficult situation to be in, because I don't think I realised at the time that it was it situation to be in, but you know, this, this, you're, you are cut off from mm. a whole part of life mm. uh, in Cambridge. Have you enjoyed being a fellow of Kings? Um, enormously is the first thing to say, and uh, the discovery of an intense feeling of uh, belonging and loyalty, mm. which came slightly later than actually becoming a fellow, but mm. um, that developing sense of a community, but there have been intensely uh, frustrating and irritating experiences in Kings as well. It's a, it's a differentiated experience, um, <laughs> which I've enjoyed a lot. Mm. Yes, yes. And have you supervised a lot? Okay. Yes, mm. yes. Um, I used to supervise the, 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 the first year biologists of cells, of course, and enjoyed that a lot. Um, and uh, since I became a professor, this sort of understanding that professors don't teach has sort of uh, stopped me supervising for kings. I mean, that's not, a, not something that I relish. I think that professors should teach. Well, it has been changed. Yes, and I'm very glad that it has, and I look forward, possibly, to doing some more teaching. Um, I do supervise. I supervise quite a lot, but I don't supervise specifically for kings, and I think that's a bad thing, and I regret it. Um, but somehow, institutionally, this this sort of thing has grown up mm. and one gets bypassed, mm. which I think is very unfortunate. Mm. You obviously enjoy both undergraduate and lecturing. Do you enjoy lecturing? I enjoy lecturing. I'm quite good. I mean, I, I shouldn't say, well, I will say this. I'm good at lecturing. Yes. Um, I am good at that. That's one thing that I am good at. I met one of uh, your students at oh, really? lunchtime today on the bridge and she oh, said really? you were good, yes. Oh, good. Well, she's That's a PhD student. That's a charming but. offer. But anyway, um, uh, no, I do enjoy lecturing. Mm. Yes. I don't, I mean, not before the event, I don't, but mm. I like lecturing. And you, did you marry? No, um, I never did. And uh, that's an occasion for some regret. I mean, I do bitterly regret not having children, I must admit. Mm. Um, greatly regret. Um, I probably could have got married to um, my very dear girlfriend in Australia. We had a very intense and wonderful relationship and it foundered when I left, um, which was sad. Mm. I think, you know, that was the moment. I mean, I, I, I um, have a very uh, delightful partner and um, she's lovely and, and couldn't be better, but I, if I, had I married Years ago, I probably would have had children, and life would have been very different. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any other people we should mention. Sydney, do you have anything to do with Sydney, Brenner? I find, um, I mean, uh, Sydney was extremely influential when I was a PhD student, I think. It may have extended 
when I first began lecturing, he used to give these wonderful lectures, I think on a Tuesday afternoon in zoology, rather like my um, biology teacher, Sidney Pass. He would come into this crowded lecture theatre, huge lecture theatre, crowded to the guns with people, sort of all the god to know what Sidney would say. Um, and he would sort of stand there and say, well, what shall I talk about today? Um, and then he would launch away. And I suspect that he talked about what he wanted to talk about, um, and that it was theatre. But, mm. but, but it was absolutely enthralling. Absolutely. I mean, just you were swept away by this man. Uh, and I still am swept away by Sydney when he talks. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but I do remember that he, he, he talked, and this must have been when I was a PhD student, he talked about the Nematode Project, mm -hmm. the LMB, the first sort of big talk when he explained why he was doing what he was doing. And, um, and I remember, and, and he sort of explained the virtues of Nematode and, and all the things they could do with it. And Peter Lawrence was there and asked him, I remember him uh, in this sort of chippy LMB kind of way, asked, question at the end said, well, Sidney, what's the philosophy behind this? What's the point of all this? Um, and he then said, well, we're going to solve the nervous system. Um, and a sort of shudder ran through me as I thought, you know, the carpet being pulled out from under <laughs> my feet. And he said, yes, all these wiring diagram boys, with, with which I strongly identified at that stage, um, can go home because um, this is you know, in that way that Sydney can, sort of, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, um, it's all over. We're going to do it. And actually, just for once, I think he's wrong. Because I don't think they did. Hmm. Um, I don't know what he feels. I mean, I, I, it isn't to say that it, it hasn't been an immensely fruitful and exciting project, but I don't think that it has actually solved the nervous system. Um, it's pointed us in lots of interesting directions. Um, but uh, it hasn't. It hasn't. Um, I've got one.